Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for staying with all of us to the end. It was difficult for me to be the last one before the coffee break. And I know everybody's starting to think, oh, I'm going to have a last day. Um, and thank you to Joanna and Angela for warming everybody up so well before my turn. Um, thank you to Anna for introducing me. I'm not entirely sure what you said, so I'll briefly reintroduce myself. Um, my name's Laura. I'm based in London, but maybe you can hear that my accent isn't British. And um, I can't quite beat Angela's combination of backgrounds, but I'm half American, half British. So that explains the pronunciation of why I've traveled from London today to be with you all. Um, and in London, I do a variety of things. Um, I teach general English, um, mostly to adults, but also to some teenagers. <laughs> all different levels of ability. Sometimes I also do exam classes or um, business English, one-to-ones, um, -one groups. They, they throw all kinds of things at me and I try and do my best to keep up. And I also do some teacher training for um, the initial certificate courses and for diploma courses and for refresher courses for teachers from overseas who want to brush up on methodology. So I do a little bit of everything. But my favorite thing that I like to do is travel to these kinds of conferences and come and visit other countries and other cultures. So I'm very happy to be here today. So thank you to Rufus Pet for sponsoring me to be here. Um, later on, there will be a handout for this session with some information. So you're welcome to take notes, but you don't need to. You'll get it all. Um, and I'd like to start with a, a little anecdote, which is that when I, I I've always loved language. I've always been fascinated by language. Some of my earliest memories are linguistic. I remember listening to my mother and father's pronunciation and thinking, should I say rather or rather? <laughs> and I must have been about two. So I've always been interested in language. I studied language later. Um, I did my first degree in linguistics. And then when I graduated from university, I thought, I don't really know what to do with this now. I mean, I'm not sure. Linguistics is kind of a bit big and woolly. And the only thing I knew was I wanted to live in London. So I applied to a bunch of different jobs and I ended up working in advertising, which I had no background in, no training in, but it seemed so gloriously creative. And I thought, I want to be in that environment and I want to learn how to, how to be creative because I don't think I really am. And one of the first things that we did on the graduate scheme was bring together all of the different new people from the different agencies for a training day. And there was a gentleman who did a presentation, and at the beginning of his presentation, he said, can you put your hand up if you think you're creative? Now remember, this room was full of about three to 400 young people, bright people, fresh minds, all interested in advertising this creative industry, and about five people put their hand up. And I remember thinking, and I didn't put my hand up. I thought, I'm not an artist, I don't design. I work in an office, that's my side of advertising. I wanna know how to do the creative stuff that all these people do. And they're actually called creatives. They use it as a noun in advertising. The people who do the artwork and the copywriting are the creatives and nobody else earns that title. And two things have happened between that day and now amongst many other various experiences which are less clearly identifiable. But they made me realize that actually I am creative. And one of those things was somebody in advertising uh, recommended that I read a book, which I will mention later, um, which got me thinking about um, spotting opportunity, because I think a lot of creativity is about opportunity. And the, the subtitle of this book is How to Recognize Hidden Opportunities. Um, and the other thing that happened was uh, I quit advertising. So I quit the creative industry and then I became creative and there's some kind of paradox in that, but it was learning to teach that made me realize that it's actually not that complicated to be creative. Um, so what I'm gonna to talk to you about in this presentation is I think there are really three main ways, very, very simple, familiar, easy <coughs> ways to realize that you are creative. So you don't need to become creative, you already are and so are your students, but you just need to realize it and it's, I don't think really a very mystical, magical, you know, dark and scary thing. I think actually it's really quite simple. Um, these three keys to this to the door to creativity are um, thinking laterally, which I'll explain in a moment, making different connections, and just generally being curious. 
So, um, first of all, we'll talk about thinking laterally. Um, now, I don't have a box, Angela, I have to borrow yours later to jump out of so creatively. But to my mind, thinking laterally is not just about thinking outside the box, it's also thinking inside the box, and under the box, and on top of the box, and all around the box, and just thinking in different ways, getting different perspectives. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate this actually with a little activity, and for this activity I need your help. So you're actually going to demonstrate what I need. Um, in a moment, you're going to have um, a sheet of paper with 15 different boxes on it. Like this. Simple boxes. And you need a pen or a pencil. The sheet of paper looks like this, and it's in your bag that you received this morning. And there's also a pen. Find that. Good stellar. Can you hold it up when you found it so I know if we're ready? Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Instructions are quite specific. What you need to do with your pen or pencil is look at each simple plain box and add something to it to transform it into something else. So for example, you might add a few basic lines and turn your box into a parcel. The second specific part of the instructions is this side of the room on my left you have three minutes to do this. This side of the room, you have only one minute. On your marks, get set, go. And stop, everybody please. <laughs> Including you. Can you just count how many different boxes you fill in? Okay, how many over here? Six, seven, can you hold it up? Three, five, eight? Five, two, six, seven. Okay, now on this side? Six, six, four, three. Three, three, fifteen. I don't believe you. <laughs> okay, so. I'm, I'm going to rush you through this a little bit, but this is an activity that came from this book that I was given that made me realize that I was creative, but maybe I was limiting myself. Because this actually is kind of an old experiment that the, the writer of the book did, and he found that when people are given three minutes, or told that they have three minutes, they produce many more pictures than the people who believe that they only have one minute. But in fact, both groups are stopped after one minute. And I just think that this proves a very powerful point, which is that Creativity and time pressure don't go together. And one of the things that I've noticed most when I'm observing teachers, and I'm fortunate to get to do a lot of observation in my job when I'm doing teacher training, is that I find some teachers very stressful to watch because they're rushing through everything. They have a lesson plan, they have aims, they're being assessed, and they have to get through this activity because they need to cover all of this in this time. And Pressure stifles creativity, and I think that one of the single easiest things that you can do to encourage creativity is just allow time for it. And that can be the difference of a couple of minutes. It can also mean, and this is a kind of trick which I use against my students, so don't tell them, giving them false limits, like I did for you. If you say you have three minutes to do it, when they really only have one, and then stop them after one. Usually they can produce more anyway, because they feel a little bit more relaxed. Or if you want them to come up with three ideas, tell them you want ten, because in the effort to get ten, they will get three. If you tell them you want three, they'll get one. So just relieving or falsifying some of the pressure on them, I think is one of the easiest ways that you can open up the creative space. Just allowing time, changing the limits. Okay. Um, and I found that my preoccupation with limits of, of what I can't do or what I don't have time for is one of the simplest things to remove. Okay. But one of the things which made me think I wasn't creative. Um, 
we're going to do a different activity now, again, to demonstrate another principle. <laughs> and it's also related to thinking laterally. And you're going to help me again, so I hope you're still ready. You don't need any paper or pens. All I want you to do is take 15 seconds, I will count, to look around the room and look at what you see. Okay, look up, down, and all around you. not a large amount, because I'm a teacher, not a millionaire, that you saw a lot more things in the room than you'd noticed the first time when you chose something to focus on. However small, I said I chose red the second time. I haven't noticed your hair. I didn't really pay attention to the color of your skirt, Angela, before. Okay. There's about four people in two rows here who are all wearing something red that I haven't really picked up on the first time. And I think, again, this is one very, very simple, very easily manipulable, if that's a word, way of encouraging creativity, is just getting your students to narrow their focus and to change their focus and to select a focus. Because often we ask very, very open questions, and that's a very rich area for creativity too, but sometimes they're too open. People just don't know where to start. So one way that you might do this with your students in the classroom, I mean, I've demonstrated with you with selecting colors, but you could get them to choose a word. Get them to, um, I don't know, take the word get, which has so many various uses and applications. And for one week, every time they see the word get in their course book, circle it. They don't necessarily have to think about it yet, but just keep their eyes open for it, because often they might fly past it when they're doing some other activity. And then at the end of the week, what have they noticed that they haven't noticed before? Do they see any patterns? Do they notice that it's used in one way more than others in this particular context? Or equally, I mean, I teach in London and English is everywhere, but English really is everywhere even outside London. If you can say to your students, spend the next few days, and every time you see or hear something in English, write down. Uh -huh. You heard earlier that this idea of recording your ideas, keeping a record of your ideas, just keeping a record. And then at the end of the week, they go, gosh, I heard English everywhere. My supermarket has an English name. There's an English word on my radio. That kid's t-shirt has an English logo. Just getting them to notice something which they might overlook. Um, so really, uh, for me, thinking laterally, you can summarize with this, there's a nice quote. <clears throat> that originality, which I believe is very uh, similar to creativity, is simply a fresh pair of eyes. It's just looking at something in a fresh way. And that's very hard when you see the same students every day, every week, every month, every year, and you get into activities that you like, you get into routines, and maybe those routines are fine, but sometimes you just need a fresh look. So I think if you take your time, don't rush things. If you take another look, look again, but look in a different way. Um, and if you take breaks, this is crucial too. And probably the one thing that every busy teacher finds it hardest to do themselves is to make time for a break. I don't have time for a break, I need to do this now. Or I won't have time to do it later. And I think this applies to the classroom as well. This applies to learning. 
If I can get you to go back to your sheet of paper with the 15 boxes, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to try and find two more ideas to fill in the boxes. Okay? Pick up that activity again. Two more boxes, 30 seconds. And stop. Can you put your hand up if you have two more boxes? That's quite a large percentage of you. Because we took a break. Okay. I think just having a break, and it doesn't necessarily mean stopping and doing nothing, but maybe just changing and doing something different and then coming back to it is another one of the simplest ways that you can be creative and feel more creative. You realize you have more ideas than you thought you did because you gave your brain a chance to rest and then come back to it. <laughs> so, you'll notice the, beneath all the boxes there's the title of the book, Did You Spot the Gorilla, it's called. This is the book. I have it with me today if anybody wants to look at it later. It's nothing to do with education. It's not ELT related. I say that somebody gave this to me when I worked in advertising because it's about spotting hidden opportunities, and their main idea was we need to make more money for our clients. But as a teacher, my main idea is we need to have more ideas. Okay. And I just found that little techniques like this, they're very, very simple, they're very easy to set up, but they just show you that you have more ideas than you think you do. You just need to give yourself time and space to come up with them. So that's thinking laterally. The other, uh, the second of the three sort of keys, I think is making connections. Um, and now I have a quotation about this. But I actually think I like the quotation from Angela's presentation better, that creativity is just connecting things. Nice and simple. Steve Jobs. When I worked in advertising, my client was Apple, so I spent a lot of time hearing about all the wonderful things this man has done. But I like that quotation, and I think it's very true. And I think that's where a lot of his success and his reputation came from. It's just making connections. So I think, essentially, the word creative doesn't necessarily mean that you need to create. It doesn't mean that you need to make something new. It means that you need to make new connections between existing things. So you take two things that you didn't use to relate to each other and you connect them, no matter how crazy it might seem at first. We're going to do an example of this, and I need two volunteers. Preferably someone sitting near the middle so I can reach you. I'm going to bring two sets of paper. In this set, there are uh, types of activity, familiar types of activity. In this set, there are familiar language points, which we often work on in the classroom. Students of all ages, all levels. I'm going to ask somebody on this side to choose an activity for me and someone here to choose a language point. so you can see that I didn't fix this. The idea is to connect verb patterns, gerunds and infinitives, so deny, doing, or want to do, and a spot the difference picture activity. Okay, so there's a language point and a type of activity that most of us have probably done in some shape or form at some point in our careers. What I want you to do is turn to someone sitting near you and think for a minute about how you might connect these two things in your classroom. So gerunds and infinitives, and spot the difference. And I'll give you two minutes. So I just went around the room to collect a few ideas from you. Um, a couple of people mentioned um, not using that picture, but just asking students to spot the difference between um, verbs which change meaning, such as stop to smoke and stop smoking. The one that's in all the textbooks. There are a couple of people with that idea. Um, Another idea was to have the students identify differences between two pictures, like a traditional spot the difference, but maybe some of the things which were different would involve verbs, which take certain patterns. Um, quite a few of the pairs had got distracted and started thinking of other ways to use pictures. 
that's completely fine, that's being creative. What I said earlier about stifling creativity, I think if you're expecting one specific answer to one question, and you don't get that answer and you reject it, that's such a missed opportunity of creativity. So just the fact that asking you one thing generated more ideas, I think is wonderful, so thank you. So this is one thing, is mixing language points and activities. Um, of the other combinations that you could have chosen from the cards I have, there are things like um, practicing articles, uh, uh, an and the, with a role play, maybe? Or um, uh, working on vocabulary for countries with um, uh, with a web quest, researching on the internet. So just looking at things in a different way, combining them. Mm -hmm. That in itself is very creative and very easy to do. Ask the students to do it. Get the students to choose a language point that they sort of understand but don't feel comfortable with, and get the students to choose an activity they really like doing, and say, okay, put them together. You love doing this particular activity? Let's use it to practice this language point, and maybe you'll learn to look at it. Um, another thing I think that's very um, easy to do and is part of making connections is just doing things a different way. So I suppose, in a sense, this is really disconnecting. For example, you always give students um, listening questions, and then they listen and find the answers. Why don't you give them the answers? And they listen and try and work out what the questions were, for example. Um, similarly, students who are a little bit weaker often get given extra homework. Maybe they're the ones who need extra time with the homework they've got. Maybe the stronger students could be given extra homework. Get them to find out something else that they want to know. A question they had in class which wasn't answered because maybe there wasn't time. Get them to go and research it and find the answer and come and tell you. So just trying to do things in an opposite way and see what happens. Okay. I think. Again, the important thing with this is to remember that not every new thing you try will feel immediately successful, but there's so much value, as Joanna said, in mistakes and failure, and that's a big element of creativity, and it can actually be a lot of fun. Um, the other thing is to cross disciplines. I find making connections between your subject, the English language, and other subjects like maths or history or science can be a very good way to bring out creativity in your students. You might have students in the group who don't really want to be there, they don't really love English, they didn't choose to do English. Maybe they love doing music, or doing maths, or PE. Giving that student a chance to talk about what they love and what they're good at in English, in the English classroom, means that the language focus becomes a secondary focus, and then it's not so intimidating. And you might see that they're actually very creative in other ways. So we're going to finish with cultivating curiosity. Now, I didn't ask you at the beginning of this presentation, and none of you asked me, at least not out loud, but why should we be creative? Does it matter? Creativity is such a big buzzword, we've kind of taken for granted that it's something we should do, but why? I think this is why. So in other words, there are many, many, many amazing things in the world, and they're not going to go away. But if we stop asking about them, if we aren't curious about them, if we just accept that they exist and never try and connect them or think about them differently, that's what will make us feel bored. That's what will grind us to a halt. We need to wonder. We need to ask why. Question marks. That's the most beautiful punctuation. <laughs> and. I think in practice, uh, this means asking the right questions. Not only what, but also how, why, why not. I had a teenage student some years ago, who every single time he said something and it was correct, and I said, okay, tell me why. He went, why not? <laughs> and he loved that question. He, he got this question, that, that was his favorite phrase in English. And I said, okay, oh, that's a good question. Why not? Tell me why not. Answer your own question. And he wanted to be contrary, he wanted to argue, he wanted to contradict, but that's fine, then great, then he's debating, then he's engaging with the language. So asking why, asking why not. If you have um, a student who has a particular interest, you know that they love, get them to tell you more about it, even if it's not related to language, they have to use language to tell you. Your student says, teacher, I don't like English, I'm going to go and, go and run around, I want to play basketball. Say, so, oh, I didn't know you liked basketball, what's your favorite team? 
What's your favorite player? What do you think of their new uniform? You know, do you like the color? Do you have a, a, a shirt with that, uh, with that team's logo? Anything. Just encouraging them to be more open and share their ideas. And just asking questions. Equally asking each other questions. Not always just following the questions the teacher gives or the book gives, but creating their own. Personalizing. I'm sure I, you don't need me to tell you that personalization is a huge part of memory and enjoyment, making it feel relevant to you. So not only asking questions, but asking the right ones. Um, I think also you need to explore, you'll note this says familiar territory, not just unfamiliar territory. You need to go back to what you think you know and look at it differently. That could mean when you're speaking to the whole class, you don't stand at the front by the board. You go and you move at the back of the classroom and then say, hey everybody, I'm over here. Can you turn around and talk to me here? Just to get them to move, just to do something a little bit different, to vary the pace. It could also mean taking your lesson outside the classroom. If possible, exchange classrooms one day. See how the art students manage in your English classroom and see how you manage in the arts classroom. And you might find that you actually generate a lot of new ideas just from being in a new environment. But it doesn't feel that new. It's the same school. You haven't really gone very far. Um, this could also mean looking at something that you already think you know in a new way. So you're doing the verb look. You say, teacher, I know the verb look. It's the, one of the first verbs I ever learned. Look. It's in all the books. Look. There's a dog in the picture. Look. The boy is flying a kite. I know look. You say, okay, but do you know look up? Do you know look after? Do you know take a look? Good looking? Any other associations you can make with something that you think you already know is quite a creative way of looking at the language. Looking <laughs> at the language. Um, and I think encouraging wonder. One of the best questions, I think, for lifelong learning is the question, why? Anybody here who has a small child, or has had a small child, or taught a small child, knows that every two-year-old ever in existence, in any language, any culture, on the face of the earth, in history, has always gone through a period of asking why about everything, until you just go, because! <laughs> but I think it's such a shame that most people grow out of that. That question, why, is so, so, so valuable. And I think also knowing that there isn't a like straight answer is also valuable. But who says you have to stop asking the question? Question why can have many possible answers. Um, and on this note about um, cultivating curiosity, I'll finish again with another anecdote, something uh, about London where I live and where I love. One of my favorite places to go in London is um, a kind of museum gallery called the Welcome Collection. And their, their description of themselves, their tagline is, a free destination for the incurably curious. And I love that. I love the way it sounds. I love the feel of the words when I say them. I love the meaning. And I love that feeling of being incurably curious. There's so much out there to know. How can you possibly get it all in your lifetime? And I kind of think, well, why can't that also describe a classroom? It's not always a free destination, depending on the classroom that you teach in, but why can't it be a destination for the incurably curious? You know, why? This is my question. You can hear I use it a lot. So, um, that's where I'm going to finish, and I hope that we've made some progress through this dark and murky, mystical area, and I hope that I've somewhat shown you the light. Thank you very much.